Well, good morning, everybody. This is from sunny Albuquerque, New Mexico. My name is Dr. George Sparks, and this is Biblical Archaeology from the Ground Down, sponsored by Bible Interact, as you don't already know. Today, I got a special guest, Mr. Thomas Winder. We are looking at Mr. Winder's big adventures. Right now, we are in Panama. So a place where I was stationed when I was in the military, but I didn't go to the extreme he did. He's going to go visit San Blas Islands. So we're going to be with Mr. Winder on his experience that he's going to share with us today. So let's welcome Mr. Thomas Winder to the program. Good morning, Thomas. Good morning, George. Nice to see you again. Oh, I got all dressed up for you today. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you look good. Got to. Uh, I'm not getting any younger. None of us are. <laughs> I got I, I, so, I was. I was so surprised to look at all these old pictures. You know, you've you asked me to do this, and I haven't seen these pictures for maybe twenty or thirty years. Mm -hmm. So you bring up being young. Yeah. Well, I was young. We were both young thirty years ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, I seen your picture. You don't have no gray hair. And that's right. I was thin. <laughs> yeah, thin and brown hair and a red and brown hair. Yeah, no um, longer. Well, 30 years ago, I was, I don't know, I think I was heavier, but just as bald. <laughs> uh, so where are we starting today? Are we going to start in New Mexico and go to Texas and travel to? Well, you know, my friend Sam Craig. Of, uh, of Sam Craig Ministries in Houston, Texas, is hooked up with the Baptist, the Southern Baptist Convention. And he wanted me to go to Panama with him on this missionary trip. We started by going to Yavisa, which, which, we, which we did our earlier program on. And, uh, and then from there, we went back to Panama City. And from Panama City, as you know, to get to these islands that are off the, that would be the Atlantic side of, of the Darien Gap, right above Columbia, in fact, you know, you have to fly down there in one of those little tiny planes with one prop <laughs> that maybe sits four people. You know, you got to be small to get four people in there three with the pilot, and a couple of bags, and you take off from Panama City, and you fly down towards Colombia, and the next thing you know, you're landing on an island that doesn't have an inch to spare on this runway, and the island is nothing but a runway. Once you land, once you get over the shock, that you actually survived this air, this little, this air ride and, a, and the landing on this little tiny airstrip that's no longer than, you know, a football field. And you actually survived that. Then after that, you get into a canoe, you know, one of those, one of those hand hewn canoes, and they take you to another island where, of course, their palapas are set up or their houses are set up uh, and, and, and where, they, where, they, where they have their village, which is why we went down there because they have this old building. They were, we were going to turn it into a church, and they needed a set of stairs to the second floor of this old concrete building. And so that's why we went to build them a set of stairs. So for a week, it took us a whole week just to frame these stairs because they're being poured out of concrete. And it was really dramatic uh, because they, these people, you know, the, the men don't do much work. They have the ladies bringing all the sand and all the gravel and all the cement and then we mix it up on the ground. They would bring buckets of water. They would actually take the buckets and 
walk them up the stairs and pour them in the forms while the men sat around uh, drinking tea and uh, smoking cigarettes and watching this big scene of these of these little Indian women that wrap their arms and their legs in colorful beads, very colorful. They wear incredibly ornate em embroidered clothes as colorful as a flower. So the women are all dressed up just as colorful and beautiful as you can imagine. And they're working their tails off while the men, yeah, they're just in rags and they're sitting around smoking their cigarettes, you know, pointing. Yeah, you go get this, and you go get that. Help these missionaries out while they build our stairs. And all and, and of course, but the men do things like go fishing or they go hunting. One one team went across to the isthmus to the to the mainland, which literally you can see from the islands because they're that close to the mainland. Wonderful out on those islands, there's no mosquitoes. Because all the mosquitoes are on the mainland, all the bugs are on the mainland, and on the island there's always a cool breeze that keeps the bug population down. Uh, <laughs> but, the, but the men go hunting, they actually eat alligators and all kinds of wild fish. And, uh, and it, it was a wild, it was definitely a wild adventure uh, into an area of the world where very, very few outsiders get to go and experience these incredible Indians that, you know, they used to work, they speak English. This was, this was the only tribe we found that spoke English down there. And the reason is, is that when they were young, they were working on the Panama Canal. They were the, they were the labor force that, that worked the Panama Canal. So they learned how to speak English, and their kids are all named after our presidents. Very, very odd. Bunch of, very odd. But they have the most incredible uh, pets. They have toucans for pets, and they have, you know, beautiful parrots. For pets and all these all these birds, uh, they play the flute. You know, Peruvian flutes and play incredible music and playing drums and everybody dances. They all get all dressed up and in the town square they put on this big show for us and all the kids were dancing in circles and playing their flutes and beating their drums. <laughs> And just having a wonderful time. Uh, absolutely no crime whatsoever. It's just one big happy family on those islands. The, uh, the main pastor actually had a house built out of concrete and blocks. Uh, very nice. And, and they eat really well because they're right on the ocean. In fact, they were feeding us lobsters. Like they were, you know, that was their cheap food. Uh, but that's what they get. They live right on the ocean. Very interesting. There's no plumbing. They didn't need any plumbing. When they go to the bathroom, they just walk out into the ocean. When they need to get clean, they just walk out into the ocean. The ocean provides everything for them. Uh, it, was, it was a great experience. I, I learned a lot about the indigenous peoples of South America, and especially these these Indians on the San Blas Islands, the San Blas Indians, uh, and they took advantage of us best they could, as far as labor goes, to work on their one and only church, which you know, since this is the biggest island of the San Blas chain of islands. While we were there, they had a pastor's conference. So all the other pastors from all the other islands came, and also some from the mainland. There were some 20 pastors there, 
and they and they asked me to do the teaching for this pastor's conference. Now, why did they ask me to do this? I'm not exactly sure, except that I was the Israeli connection even back in those days. And they wanted to know about Israel. They wanted to know what the Bible said about Israel and the Jewish people and, and that sort of thing. So for a couple of days, I taught all these pastors uh, from Panama. I basically went from Genesis to Revelation and traced the, the life of, of the Hebrews, where they came from, what God was doing with them, why they're the chosen people, and why they're in that piece of land that we call Israel today, the biblical homelands of, of the Jewish people. It was fabulous, George. You would have loved it. Uh, the people were wonderful. They enjoyed our company. They really loved the fact that we showed up to help them build these stairs and to teach them more about the Bible. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm the one that, that was enriched by going down there. The San Blas Islands was wonderful, unlike Yavisa, where we, where we had to you know, live in this Casa Raton and, and deal with rats and bugs and snakes and alligators and all that stuff. On the San Blas Islands, we were, we were cared for like almost like royalty. Wow, we had beds to sleep in and, and real rooms. And they cooked for us every day and they took care of us. It was really great. It was great. Had a wonderful time. We, uh, we, had, we accomplished a great deal for the church and for the kingdom. So it was, it was, it was fantastic. I'd like to go back. I'd go back to the San Blas Islands anytime. So let me ask you something. You're on an island, and I see you send me pictures of these islands, a few pictures, and it actually looks like you're going to the island. I've seen also, let me back up, I've seen that little piece of land, that little island that is nothing more than a run runway. I bet you it's the same one you landed on. And then also um, you're going to the island on a, it's not really a, it's just like a, a big canoe. It's got an outboard engine. And you guys can see the, but from this is what I'm getting to. Why as you're closing in on these islands, it looks like it's the beginning of a Gilligan's Island show. It sure does. Yep. I mean, the huts have the, those uh, reed roofs, and it's all made out of bamboo. Which leads me to the question, where do you get the wood to do the framing to make the steps? Well, that was our question as well. But they're close enough to the mainland. Okay. So on their, on their big canoes, they can go back and forth. They can actually get supplies from Panama City and from other cities of Panama. So they can. And, I mean, where do they get all the concrete blocks to build those houses? Because, I mean, you don't, you want a house built out of concrete if you could afford it because those palapas blow down. Every time a storm comes through, your palapa will just blow over. So you want concrete if you can get it. And so they, they must have, you know, some sort of supply chain where they can go back and forth and actually get supplies, lumber, wire, you know, concrete. They had bags of cement. We had, you know, they made their own gravel, right, and, uh, and, and, and clean sand. But they had bags of cement to do, to mix. So all that stuff is coming from the mainland. Then when you're mixing it, can you use salt water to mix? No. Concrete? No. Got to have fresh water. Okay. And they so, somewhere they get fresh water as well. They're drinking. But it's tropical. Fresh water. Maybe it rains a lot. 
Well, it does it does rain down there. I'm sure they save rainwater, uh, but maybe there's actually wells that they have dug. I'm not I'm not sure, but they have to have fresh water. They're not drinking ocean water. Yeah, you can't. No way. So, when you said uh, that they were small, like uh, how tall are the, the natives on San Blas Island? Well, they were a little bit bigger than the Indians over on in in Yavisa, uh, but they're not. They're not you know, tall Americans like we are, uh, I imagine the tallest, the very tallest San Blas uh, Island Indian would be about five feet tall. Yeah. Yeah, they're not, they're not big people. And they have, and they, and they're, of course, they have some interbreeding problems. Yeah. Because their populations are so small that cousins end up marrying each other, having children. And so there are also, they have albinos among them because, because of the interbreeding. Uh, but, but it doesn't look like they have a bunch of mental problems. They were, they were, they had school. They were quite educated. And of course, that's why they were having the pastors' conference to uh, to to gain more knowledge. So, in a pastors' conference, there, um, your, well, your Central America are do they practice Catholicism? Are they are they Catholic? Well, in this instance, there were Catholics around. For instance, there was a Catholic church. In Yavisa, at the end of the dirt road, where we first went, but there were no Catholics, no Catholic uh, priests, no Catholic churches, no nuns at all on the San Blas Islands. Huh. They they had they had a Baptist church, right. and they were Protestants. So we didn't so we didn't have that that friction. Believe me, we did have some friction in Yavisa because I wanted to go invite everybody in the village, including the Catholics, to come see the Jesus movie. You know, we dragged it down there with the generator and the projector and the screen and everything else. I wanted to go invite everybody in the village, all the Catholics. But the Baptist leadership said, oh, no, we don't mix with those Catholics. And so that le that left a bad taste in my mouth when it comes to some missionary work, because instead of pure missionary work to the poor, you know, to the uneducated, etc., you know, we had it was more like competition with the Catholic world for numbers, and uh, and I, and I didn't like that very much because I'm a non-denominational guy. And uh, so that so as an independent missionary, you know, I don't get denominational support and I don't and I don't play that game. Uh, when I preach, I don't preach a denominational. You know, view of, of one doctrine or another, I strictly teach what the Bible says. Solo, solo uh, Christorum, solo scriptures so that's, okay, that's let me ask you another question um so you you flew out to san blast how long were you on the islands uh, a week i know you said i think you yeah said we were there for about 10 days okay so a little over a week two, yeah two two long weekends and the week in the middle that's a, that's actually a long time to be out on an island like that well because it, it isn't is. like it's a, res a resort you know but well, we ate like it was a resort, but, I imagine you would. But, but I had to learn how to, you know, get up in the morning and, and uh, go out into the ocean to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Very odd. This, If you can just imagine in your mind, 
You know, um, basically everybody's waking up when the sun gets up. And the next thing you see is everybody walking out into the ocean. And they're all doing the same thing. <laughs> it's like it's like a communal bathroom. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess it, it has to happen somewhere. Uh, I said like a, a couple billion fish can't be wrong. That's right. And uh, I don't think the ocean minds at all. And apparently uh, it's a fairly clean way to keep the island. So there's oh, it absolutely would be, wouldn't it? Keep all that waste and all, all that, that is gone, man. Doesn't I imagine it's, it. it's pretty nice because you said you got to breathe so you don't have the bugs, you don't have the right. mosquitoes. Oh, it's ideal living. Honestly, yeah. 85 degrees. The water's 85 degrees. It's yeah. kind of like Hawaii in a way. Now, I'm from Ohio, and all the lakes in Ohio are kind of like the Rio Grande in New Mexico. You can't see nothing. It's brown, right? right? It's, it's very dirty. And uh, I really didn't know that water was supposed to be, supposed to be so blue and so clear until I finally, well, um, one time I went to Florida with my parents years and years ago, back in the 60s. But until I got in the military when we were traveling, and had opportunities to, to see the ocean and how blue it is and that you can actually see the fish. And you know what? In a sense, that's quite an experience when you come from a region where, you know, you, the trees look a certain way. You know, the grass like in Ohio is green and everything's green. But the water, when it comes to like the lakes, are absolutely dirty. But we swam in it when we were kids. We didn't know any better, you know. Sure. However, when you get to like what you're saying, the San Blas Islands, and they're surrounded by this really blue water, and you can see the fish, and um, and, and of course, if you get out to the islands and away from the shore, you don't have to worry about the bugs, and you then usually you do have a breeze. And in a way, that's like you said, that's a pretty nice way to live. Although you can live pretty nice and still not know Jesus. Well, those people live in paradise. And fortunately, they do know Jesus. And they are, and they are keeping the faith on, on the islands that I was on. Uh, very faithful people. They would come to service. They would sing, you know, hymns and, and gospel songs. And, and, they, and they were quite learned. And they had a hunger to know more. They really, really had a hunger to know more about what the Bible said. And I, and I was thrilled because nobody, nobody told me ahead of time that I was going to be asked to teach a bunch of pastors. Uh, right. and, and so that just happened impromptu. But wow, what a, what a fantastic opportunity to, to teach and to relate the love of Jesus and the love of God and, and how much he loved us all to literally come to earth to sacrifice himself, etc., for our redemption and, and for our eternal life. It was wonderful. I loved every minute of it. Oh. So how long did it take you to get from New Mexico? So you went from New Mexico to Texas to Texas to did you fly to Panama or fly to yeah, Columbia? Yeah, it went, it, the plane went directly from Houston straight to Panama City. Panama and, City. And when we got to Panama City, you know, they didn't, uh, they didn't, they didn't really appreciate us bringing all that equipment because uh -huh. we didn't have government permission, and so they didn't want to let us in. <laughs> Now, you'll love this because I know that you know about bakshish and we go kamish. Yeah. Well, there's always a kamish in yeah, these sir. third world countries. And, uh, and, and I know that you're good at that because I've watched you personally in Jericho one time. Oh. Like this. And so I am also one of those oh, wow. people that are, that are well endowed with, with the abilities to pass a little bit of bakshish around to, to make things smooth and to get what you want without, you know, opening up too big of a can of worms 
yeah, with you don't government want to. officials. So at the airport, my buddy Sam, he had never done this before, and they were not going to let us keep that generator. They were not going to let us through the, uh, you, you know, the passport uh, uh, place with the generator. So I just simply pulled the official out from behind the, the desk, took him around the corner, and gave him 50 bucks. <laughs> gave him 50 okay. bucks. And he said, okay, get this thing out of here. So I right. said, Sam, grab the other end of this box. We got a green light. Let's go. <laughs> so we yeah. grabbed that box and, and scooted to the taxi, and uh, off we went. Now, do you remember what year you were there in uh, Panama? Well, goodness, it had to be it had to be way back around 1993 or so. Oh, so there you go. I, that's when I was stationed down there. I think we were there about the same time. Because and I know now, we landed on the same airstrip and took off from the same airport. Uh, the military came in and they had a confrontation. Something was going on with the Panama Canal. That's right. And so much drugs were moving through. Uh, so the, I think, I'm not for sure which type of military branch. I think it was like Special Forces and Airborne or something went in. And when I was there, none of the traffic lights worked because they got knocked out by the military. No traffic, another, another traffic, not the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the stop wow. signs. Not where yeah. all those. And then the trains were derailed because they were blown over. A lot, not a lot, but there were some buildings out of concrete that were completely destroyed, especially around the water, like if you were going to come and dock. So when I was there, they were still, that was still a mess. And, uh, but like you said, uh, other than that, we, we, we were advised safe places in the city, like in any city. You got good places of a city, you got bad places of a city. <laughs> and we were told in Panama uh, where not to go, and also restaurants where not to eat, because I guess they recycled the food there. If you didn't finish your plate, they would heat it up and put it on somebody else's plate. <laughs> and well, that's how we like the third world. Yeah. yeah so. And uh, and I told you what the last video when I was stationed there, um, what I did is that I um, I did tests. Now these are all test tubes, and everybody's a number. I don't know any names, but for eight hours a day, I would test and run test tubes and samples, and it'd just be positive or negative. This is kind of boring after a while, but that's what I did: test for STDs. Well, that's you know? probably more interesting than just testing for malaria like everybody well, else is malaria, doing. Malaria was big there, too, yeah. Oh, malaria is a big deal down there. We had to take these big, giant horse pills mm -hmm. on a day and uh, in case we got bit by a mosquito. Right. But I was wearing all that. Uh, I was wearing all that army jungle juice, so, so nobody was getting close to me. <laughs> Right, well, that's you know it's it's very interest it's very interesting and, and extremely a uh, unique experience that you, sometimes you, you don't have to go. It seems far, but with today's travel, it's it, it's sometimes just a matter of hours. Like from here to Israel, I guess from here to Israel it could be uh, probably ten plus hours. But when I was in Ohio, once I got to New York. This is an eight-hour plane flight to get over Central America. I forgot how I did because I had a uh, went with an army hop, so that was a little bit different. And then we started from Ohio, so Ohio probably to maybe more a uh, central state from there, and then Texas. Texas yeah. flew back over to Pan uh, Central America, landed in Panama. Well, on the base, this is kind of interesting. <laughs> on the base, they had a Burger King and a Popeyes chicken. Oh wow! Wow. Yeah, so I thought, like, how in the yeah. world you get? I always thought, how in the world you get Burger King down the middle of Panama? <laughs> That's a good question. Popeyes chicken. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. they did. Yeah, that'd be something if you went to San Blas Island. You think you're you take a plane and then you land on this yeah. island. When you get to the island, there's a sign right there that says, "Hey, Burger King." 
No, nope. <laughs> that won't happen. I'm just joking. <laughs> that didn't happen. But in Panama reason. City, Panama City is is a big modern city. Yeah, it's pretty big back then. Yeah, it is. It is, and and there's even a Jewish presence in Panama that that I did not know of when when we showed up. But in one of the hotels we were staying at, there were a bunch of rabbis staying there that had just flown in from Israel for some Jewish conference they were having. And and because of my Israeli background, uh, we found ourselves in the same elevator on a Friday afternoon. So I sing... To the rabbis, I sang them a song, their Shabbat Shalom song. And okay. they were just smiling from ear to ear. I'm sure that made their day that these crazy Gentiles from America that were in Panama just happened to know some Hebrew songs and sang for them their Shabbat song for the Sabbath evening. It was awesome. It was awesome. I mean, you know, the, I guess some of the things we could learn from today is that uh, really to, to have a, a unique life is that you got to get out and do something. And it's not going to be – these poor kids, they sit at home and play video games. Oh, terrible. And they're just – and they're missing out because yeah. – not, not all kids, but enough that yeah. to really get out there and get to meet people and through meeting people and – and sharing experiences and being invited to different locations. Um, you never know what's going to happen out there. There is a little bit of risk involved, but what an interesting life you have, Thomas, because <laughs> you were you were in the pyramid, uh, sleeping in Khufu's sarcophagus. <laughs> and I remember then you were then up in northern Israel, you were at Tel El Hamam for a while. And yeah, I've done some crazy things. North, I, mean, sort of, sort of, I must have some gypsy blood in me. Yeah. Also, I remember you were involved in, um, we're out of time almost, but uh, it was the Dolman. Was there something called the Dolman Project or something like that? Well, there's a bunch of Dolmans. These are grave sites for the giants. So wherever you find dolmens, you will find giants and vice versa. And there happens to be the biggest dolmen. One of the biggest dolmen sites in the world is right above Tal El Hammam, which was the city of Sodom. And so naturally, there's a big dolmen site there. And, and our team, really, were the only team that I've ever known that were we were lucky enough to find two dolmens that had not been dug out by the night diggers. Because, I mean, okay. these things have been around for thousands of years, and everybody knows that there's there's stuff down buried down in them, uh, whether it's old pottery that's valuable, you know, to collectors, like the stuff you have all around you and the stuff that's all around me in my background here as well. Uh, very valuable things or gold. The night diggers are always digging for gold. Uh, you can actually count on night diggers showing up just about every time when you're in the Muslim world, at least, or anywhere near, uh, you know, very poor people because they want gold. They can't even imagine that we're digging just to add to the historical record that we're not looking for gold that we're not looking for anything quote unquote valuable we're not we can't take it anyway but we're archaeologists and we're looking to back up the historical record which of course happens every single day but the night diggers are there so they're going to come dig in fact up uh, up on mount herman just this last summer a bunch of night diggers showed up at uh, Bir and Soba, which is one of the cultic high places, and they they dug out the pit that was up there. Look, and I'm sure they're looking for gold, <laughs> but 
but I thought that was great. I should have them come on all those cultic high places and dig out all the pits because they did us a favor. You know, whether or not they found anything, I doubt that they found anything because if they had, they'd still be digging, looking for more. And, uh, but they, yeah, they can, they sometimes they can actually do, do archaeologists a favor because, wow, they can dig a big hole in one night looking for treasure. And they do that in the dolmen fields. They're all dug out. So what we're talking about, people, are dolmens. I spent D-O-L. M-E-N. -E That's right. So, dolmen. And, and actually, they look like Fred Flintstone houses. <laughs> yeah, they're, the two, they're two big stones as the, as the posts. And one big giant stone that lays on the top. Uh, and, of course, it looks like a doorway or a window to another dimension, perhaps. And maybe that's what it was signifying to, to the people that were buried uh, in these dolmens. In fact, they might have been for a family, not just an individual, because we found layers of deposits of, of, of treasure, so, well, pottery. With, with, their, with their ash, because what we think, and of course this is speculative, but we think that the dead would be laid on top of those big stones so that birds could eat the flesh and clean the bones, clean the skeleton. Then the skeleton is burned or crushed, and then the ash or the crushings are literally deposited in vessels, small vessels, like the ones you have in your, you know, right behind you. And then they are buried to uh, commemorate the dead person. That's what we think. But of course, nobody was around thousands of years ago to witness these things. All right. Well, Thomas, we're out of time. I thank you for this adventure to San Blas Islands, Panama, where you actually took a plane that landed on a little bitty island. And from there, you got a little dugout canoe with a outboard engine and went over to an island and built the steps going up to a church. So it's going to be high, maybe because of storms and flooding. And uh, But that's quite the adventure. And you're there for a little bit over a week. Well, you got to preach the gospel. Well, thank you, George, for having me. And uh, people can reach me at Holy Land Research Institute dot org. Holy oh, Land Holy Research Land. Institute. Okay, Holy Land Research Institute dot org. Yeah, and, and you can see what I'm doing. And now I'm concentrated completely on the unreached people group, the Druze. Or the Druzim in uh, in Hebrew, and they are an unreached people group that live on the slopes of Mount Hermon, up on the Syrian Lebanon border, the highest village of the entire Middle East in uh, in in elevation, up on the snow line. All right, Thomas. Thanks again for joining us. I appreciate uh, All right, George. The, your adventures that you've been sharing with us. Trust in the Lord that to go there like you do and not knowing if you're coming back sometimes. So yeah, that's a, it's always fun to get home in one piece. <laughs> right. All right. 